The first law of thermodynamics starts off the very first sentences, there is an equation of state to the system. And so right here, there's equations of state. It's just an equation that describes the state of a system. Equation of state. Now there was the state postulate that said if you have two independent intensive properties, you can, dis you can define the state of a, you know, a compressible system, right? Incompressible system, whatever. So there's, there's many equations of state. So there's many of them. And what have we covered so far as equations of state? There's the internal energy. There's the enthalpy. We, last lecture, we introduced the enthalpy. But there's, there's, ex there's many, many equations of state. If it's an equation of state, what are two properties I need to define it? <coughs> temperature and pressure. If I know the temperature and pressure of my system, I can define its internal energy, its entropy, its enthalpy, and many other equations of state. The most well-known equation of state is the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is, it doesn't, it doesn't look like this U, S, H, you write it, 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 but it is an equation of state. It defines the state to the system. P, big V, is equal to M, R gas, T. How can I say it's an equation of state? Because I have the temperature and pressure. I'm giving, now, granted it's an equation, and it looks like I can write pressure in terms of temperature. It's an equation of state, though. Another way to write it is I can put it in small v, where I divide through by the mass. So I have specific volume, volume per unit mass. And then I have the gas constant times temperature. And just, you know, for reference, you know, you know, this is the gas constant. PV equals N R U T, where now this is the number of molecules or atoms. Here this is a gas constant and a mass. And so I can relate this with this. So M our gas equals the molecular weight times N times the gas constant. So if I know the number of molecules within my system and I know the molecular weight, and so then grams per mole times the number of moles gives me grams, which is M. And then I can write it as so this is the mass of the gas in my system. You know, in order to find my system, I have to draw it and identify a boundary. And then once I do that, I have my surroundings and I have my system. My system has a given mass. So this is the PV diagram, or uh, I guess it's temperature. This is temperature up here, and then specific volume. So this, I could make it PV, it would look similar. But So I have temperature versus specific volume, and I draw the phase diagram, and so here's my bell curve. And I can, when can I use the ideal gas law? And it's going to be very, very valid to describe this. It only a superheated region does the ideal gas if I had a non-ideal gas, I couldn't put a gas constant. Instead, I would have some, some, some variable here, which would be a function also of temperature and pressure. So I'll get to that in a second. So there's other equations of state. So there's other equations of state. And another well-known equation of state is the Van der Waals equation of state. And now you can see, I still have P over here. I still have V over here. I still have some constant R. And then I have T, but now I have these other parameters, A and B, and then I can relate those to critical pressures and temperatures. Okay, so there's a lot of other equations of state. So here's some other viral equation of state. Okay, so what does this one look like? This one looks like a Taylor series expansion. No, in principle, we can describe any property by an infinite sum of sines and cosines. 
So here I can, so the sign part are all the odd components. So odd, or I could say odd, odd, right? And then I have the even square to the even power. So I have a viral equation of state. Okay, this is just Taylor series expansion. And then there's other ones. You can see textbooks. And then, you know, we talked about the critical point where I have this bell curve that looks like this. And so I have pressure or temperature. And up here I have the critical point. So sometimes if you're working with the system up here, so actually right now there are a lot of uh, like new research areas, or not new, but re, you know, uh, revived research areas where they're interested in making energy producing or consuming devices, energy conversion devices that use supercritical fluids. So they're working with fluids with the temperatures and pressures in this region. So definitely if you're working on technologies with supercritical fluids or so up here, then such thing as a reduced pressure and reduced temperature. So that's the pressure of the system relative to the pressure at that point and the reduced temperature, temperature of my system relative to the critical temperature. And then this table here just basically gives, you know, so if I have water, the critical temperature is that, critical pressure is that. You know, so I have molecular weights. So, okay, H2O. So I can just look up with the periodic chart and get my molecular weight. And then this is a gas constant you can find. I can calculate it based off of this. But a lot of times you'll just look this up in the back of the book. And so this is just two numbers of some of these properties that you can find in the book. But if you know all the composition of everything within your system, you know the relative amounts of each. So if I have a gas of oxygen, 50% molecular oxygen, 50% molecular hydrogen, I can get a molecular weight, average molecular weight of the gas within, and I can get a gas constant for it based off that previous. Or I could just go look it up. Okay. Then there's other things you can do. You can look at compressibility factors versus the, you know, so that's related to the specific volume ideal versus actual. So we don't use that much, but I'm just going to show it to you. I have a saturated liquid vapor mixture. Of course, I have this bell curve and then saturated liquid line, saturated vapor line. In here, I have a liquid vapor mixture. Out here, I have a superheated superheated vapor. Over here, I have a subcooled or compressed liquid. So this, of course, this is my critical point. So I have this, it looks like that. And then if I want to talk about liquid, solid phase transformations, I can draw the other lines and I can put sublimination where I go from vapor to solid. So if you take an ice cube and you put it in your freezer, right? Your freezer is at, at well below the, you know, the saturation temperature. Or, so you shouldn't get any evaporation. But if you put one ice cube in your freezer and you leave it there for a year, I guarantee you when you look at it a year later, and even if you don't open the door and you didn't change and you don't add any air to it, right? All you do is change the temperature. You're going to have a smaller ice cube because you're going to go from li liquid. So you have liquid solid phase transformations. So I could add that stuff down here if I wanted. But nevertheless, I have this. And we're interested in this region where we have liquid vapor mixture. And so related to that is this quality. So sometimes it's called the vapor quality, x. And so x is the total mass of vapor. or or is the mass of vapor. So if I draw a little cube and I put and all of these little packets, of course it's going to be well distributed. All of these represent vapor and everything surrounding it I should do it in red.
is liquid. So I can get the mass of all the vapor. Now, of course, if I take something and it's going to be water vapor liquid, it's not going to be big blobs of vapors surrounded by a liquid. But, you know, I'm just doing this for illustration purposes that I have a mixture of li liquid and vapor. So I could get the total mass of vapor within my system. Given I drew a system, you know, let's draw a boundary. Okay. So I have my boundary. And so I have this. And if I want to know the vapor quality, I can get the total mass of vapor within my system divided by divided the mass of the vapor plus the liquid. So then I could write it in this form, mass vapor, mass total. And then I could also say mass gas, mass total. And mass total is just the mass of vapor plus the mass of liquid, or in terms of these subscripts, mg, mf. So I can get this expression, the vapor quality or the quality factor is the mass of gas divided by the total mass within. Or in words, I can define it as the vapor quality or quality factor So there's different names to this, just like when we had that region on, on this curve up here, where it could be subcooled or compressed liquid. So if you're dealing with things that are not going, we are not really concerned with temperature changes so much, you're more concerned with compression, <coughs> compressing things, then it, you're in a kind of a field where you want to kind of more refer to this as compressed liquid. But if you're dealing with heat exchangers and stuff like this, where you're you're removing heat from a hot engine block or something like, like that, then this region has more meaning to say subcooled liquid. So there's different contexts and subfields where you have different terminology. And the same thing happens here. You can say vapor quality or quality factor. It, in words, vapor quality or mass fact, you know, is the mass fraction of vapor in a saturated liquid vapor mixture. So if I go up to here, Thank you. If I go here, and I'm just going to say x equals what? I'll put blocks around them. Is it a fraction or percentage? It's a number. So it's a number between 0 and 1. So I should do that here. X, well actually, it can be when you deal with subcooled stuff and you start going, but in the, within the bell curve, in this region, let's just consider X within this region. Because once you get over here, it becomes a negative number. But I don't want to get into that aspect. So, so I'll just say, this is the range. So one represents 100% vapor. So I'll put the ranges within the bell curve. And so what is it here? 100%. So if I were to take this, I would have no liquid. It would be all vapor. What is it here? What is it here? close to 0.5, close to 50%. So I'm in the middle of the bell curve, 50% vapor, 50% liquid within my system.